Greetings, Unhidden Voices family. I can't start this episode without first reaching out and sending all of my love and support to um, our state here of California is on fire. And this is not the first time. It's actually um, repeatedly that we've had um, this, this natural disaster of fires. But um, this, a couple, maybe less than a week ago, we actually had um, thousands of lightning strikes, um, which is unheard of for our state. And um, and that ended up resulting in fires burning all across the state. And so um, we actually, um, here in San Francisco, our air is unhealthy. Um, that's happening throughout the Bay. There's been evacuation notices. And so um, throughout the state and um, our California firefighters are working diligently to save our lives. So I just want to um, shout that out and kind of let everybody know that um, to please keep us here in your thoughts and prayers and also that we need to um, be very diligent about making sure that uh, the folks who believe that climate change is real it, are voted into our office uh, and voted into office. Um, this episode is episode 10. This episode is a continuation of our conversation on um, reimagining schools. Um, this episode actually is also serving the purpose of uh, dual purpose because um, it will be aired with as part of the convocation on anti-racism at, at Sacramento State University. So I'm very proud and pleased to um, have this conversation with colleagues of mine um, from Sacramento State. Margarita Berta Avila is um, a senior uh, faculty member in the teaching credentials department. She actually has been my faculty mentor since I started working at Sacramento State uh, uh, five years ago. Additionally, uh, she is president of the California Faculty Association. Um, like Margarita Jose Cintron, it happens to be another senior faculty member who actually he's retired this year, but Jose has done a lot of work with the uh, CFA, California Faculty Association, and also done a lot of work to support uh, teachers of color, um, bilingual teachers, and he actually um, ran the bilingual authorization program at, um, at Sac State. Um, Mimi Coughlin um, has done work um, with, uh, she's a historian and she looks at women in history. And um, she was actually on my hiring committee when I first interviewed um, to come on to Sac State as faculty. And then Dale Allender uh, recruited me to Sac State and he and I met at UC Berkeley because he was one of my professors. And um, I took a course with him on digital use that actually inspired me to do the work that I uh, do on gender, race, and digital literacy. We have this very um, healing and um, important conversation about how racism influences not just our work, but our lives, and um, the ways that we can uh, be co-conspirators for each other um, based on the struggles that we, that we have um, in this society. So please listen, learn, and amplify with us. Okay, so I'm gonna start with uh, Margarita, and then you can toss it to whoever you want. But tell us your name, your background, and talk about like your your how long have you been at Sac State? All right. Well, my name is Margarita Berta Avila, and I have been at Sac State since 2001, so close to 20 years. Um, I'm originally from Los Angeles. I uh, grew up in downtown LA, and my mother is from El Salvador, and my father's from Peru. And I identify as a Chicana ex from El Salvador in Peru. And so for me, that means that I have committed myself to the liberation of not only my community, but also the communities um, that we engage with, all communities. Um, my family is also from the southern regions of the Pipil Nation in El Salvador. And so I'm also indigenous to this, to this continent. And I'll toss it to uh, Dale. 
I was saying that what's significant about the location and the time and the name is that um, in Southeast Ohio, Putnam was the seat of the Underground Railroad. It started with uh, a, a number of uh, wealthy white people by that name, Putnam actually, um, but uh, also uh, less discussed are some very wealthy former escaped enslaved folk who um, uh, made their fortune and fame in that area. And they helped also establish the African Methodist Episcopal Church in which G.W. Turner and all of his lineage were a part of up until uh, more recent times. Um, and it was in that church also that they had underground railroad stations. And they're all buried in Woodlawn Cemetery. Uh, they were a town of folk who had such religious zeal. The folks across the river who were pro-slavery called them all saints. And they are all buried in Woodlawn Cemetery, the Turner line from that era, along with the white abolitionists and so forth. So um, that's a side that I'm reclaiming through the study and through newfound relationships with family members as well. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Wow, that's that's really wonderful. Okay, so who do you toss it to? I am going to toss it to Mimi. Okay. Hi, folks. My name is Mimi Coughlin, and that name actually it's short. You might know me as Mary Coughlin if you were uh, my bank or my doctor or something. Um, and the reason I mention that is because that resonates as a very Irish Catholic name. Most of my family members are named Mary in some form or another, most of the women, and that's purposeful. It's a, so anyway, um, my background is I was born in Denver, Colorado, but I grew up in Littleton, which is a suburb. My dad is a Denver native and my mom is um, born in Iowa and then moved to Nebraska. Um, her dad was part of the Rural Electrification Association. So there's a lot of, um, I didn't know him, but there's kind of a lot of pride in sort of that New Deal era program and his, you know, his work bringing electricity to ranchers and so forth. Um, so I grew up in, in Littleton. My family is still in the Denver area. My family is part of a multiple generation business in that area. Um, I am kind of the renegade in that I, I left Denver and I never really settled back in there. And I've been at Sac State since 2003. And I've been in education since I got my own teaching credential in 1989. And I've taught at many, many different kinds of schools, international, parochial, uh, public, private, boarding school, et cetera. And um, I'm raising Californians, which is kind of a, a funny thing to me, um, but that's very purposeful. We moved here to be in a very diverse environment. My children are um, Guatemalan by birth, and I very much wanted them to be surrounded by folks that looked like them and for them to have a lot of different role models. And um, I'm really happy to say that that has been, that is a big impact in their life. They are surrounded by folks that, um, all kinds of people they can access as role models. And that's one of my proudest accomplishments. Wonderful. And, and I will throw it to Dr. Centron. Okay, uh, hello to everyone who's watching this video whenever you're watching it. My name is Jose Cintron, and to juxtapose something Dale said a few minutes ago, I'm the oldest OG in this teaching team. This is my 32nd year at Sac State, my second year of retirement, uh, and I teach one class, uh, and I can do so for, I think, four or five years. Uh, but I am officially retired from Sac State. Uh, I'm a migrant of uh, Puerto Rico. My parents uh, brought me to Northwest Indiana at the age of four. All of us were born in a mountain, a small mountain town in the middle of Puerto Rico called Comerio. 
And uh, as I said, raised in Northwest Indiana, to be specific, about 30 minutes away from Chicago and about 15 minutes uh, west of Gary, Indiana, which most people have heard of. Uh, started uh, as a uh, voc ed person in high school, specifically in the auto shop. Uh, that was my destiny until I was recruited by a black man from Purdue University. Um, got to Purdue, did well, apparently, and that eventually led me to a PhD in education and been teaching and preparing teachers at Zach State uh, for those 30 second years. Um, since I am the oldest in this team, um, I am a product of all those movements that we have seen a resurgence of, of late. Uh, I grew up in the US that was still grappling with the vestiges of the movements of the 60s and the early 70s. I played a small role in that coming up when I got to university. And that sort of put a spark in me towards activism, which I have um, pursued the entire, my entire professional life and personal life, including activism in our California Faculty Association Union, along with uh, Margarita and others. And uh, here we are, we're still battling some of the same issues that many of us got involved in logos many years ago. And I think in some ways, um, this is a good time to be alive again, to see the resurgence of the people's activism and certainly led by predominantly folks of color and specifically both uh, the black community. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all for those, that introduction and um, sharing of yourselves. Uh, we're really excited about this conversation. So um, I think we can't, we will be remiss um, to begin this conversation without asking, how are you and how is your family? So um, Jose, why don't we start with you and then go back? Uh, we, Adele and I, my wife, are both well. Uh, sequestered like most of us uh, since I'm 66 years old and she's a little younger she's been sort of handling all the the matters of the house I spend my days here doing projects around the house working on our syllabus getting on the internet listening to podcasts blah 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 uh, my stepson Adele's son is well uh, also he's a, a musician uh, by training uh, he's been uh, making the music, music production, uh, unemployed, obviously, due to the pandemic. Uh, all of Adele's people uh, who live in San Diego, parents, brothers, are all healthy. Uh, my parents have long passed. Um, I have a sister on the island who uh, is okay, uh, health-wise also. Um, that's it on my family. All right. Um... Mimi, why don't you go and then we'll just go back the way we came. Okay. Um, well, we're sheltering in place successfully. Um, my, myself, my wife, and my two daughters. Um, uh, we're, you know, our biggest challenge is figuring out how to do school with four people in the house. And, um, you know, just making the adjustments to that. They're, they're young adults, but they're, their wings have been clipped by all of this. Um, so I'm kind of enjoying the time to bond with them and just, you know, watch them grow in a, in a way that I had not anticipated. Um, <laughs> so they're the nest that we're all in the nest and we're trying to keep it, you know, keep it a healthy, happy place. And back to you, Dale. So going back around, right? Um, I, I'm 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 well as well. Um, in some ways, this is real common for me because when I'm not out traveling or on campus teaching, I'm actually right here working. Um, and the the biggest difference for me is lacking like the fact that I don't have to look for parking or chase down a plane is that um, my family's actually mostly here with me all the time, actually. Um, 
So they're not always as well. They like to be out doing their normal thing. Um, my oldest daughter is uh, not with me. She lives on her own. We see each other um, once or twice a day for short periods. And so uh, that's nice. Um, I know even so, she still feels uh, isolated being by herself a lot um, and not seeing her mother. Um, my son is back in the Midwest and, and, and he's, he's well as well. So um, I, I think that in some ways, um, being that we are part of the university, there's a particular privileging in that mm -hmm. economically, even as we still face uh, uh, labor disputes and labor rights issues and, and needing to uh, maintain ground on that front. Um, so I can't complain in that regard. I am aware and abreast of others, students who even just this week have reported uh, coming down with illness, uh, others out in the broader community who are um, being challenged in other ways. I see the homeless camp very close to campus and between campus and where my daughter lives. I've seen it grow and grow and grow this summer. So I'm, I'm mindful of the status, even as I say, I'm, I'm well, and I'm acknowledging that. Margarita. That's a hard question to answer these days for me. Um, physically, like everybody else, you know, uh, my family is healthy, um, and I feel grateful for that and, and know the privilege, as many have mentioned already, that that I have to be able to say that I'm healthy in, in comparison to my own family members that have to be out on the front lines and are frontline workers. And so I'm very cognizant of that. But to answer the question of like how I am, I mean, on one end of the spectrum, we're in the midst of a of resurging movement that offers a lot of hope, but knowing that there's a lot of work behind that. And then at the same time, living simultaneously with concern and fear of a pandemic that is also bringing about to the um, nothing new, but, but bringing forth more so the inequities that exist with respect to healthcare, um, access, resources, and what that impact can have on on us and, and many, depending on you know our circumstances and our work, et cetera. And so there's a lot of different emotions I feel every day. Um, and, and I feel tired, uh, just emotionally tired, physically tired, um, because you know the work has to happen every day. And so uh, Jose Cintron mentioned that we're part of the California Faculty Association and it has been nonstop since the pandemic. And then with uh, a Black Lives Matter movement that is happening right now, there's a responsibility to be part of that work. Um, not because we have to, but because we need to be, you know? And, and so it's, it's every day um, thinking about how do we move forward? How do we, how can we make an impact not only with respect to the pandemic and securing um, working conditions and securing uh, uh, people's access to, to healthcare, uh, but then also mobilizing uh, for anti-racism, social justice uh, with Black Lives Matter and, and other people of color and communities um, within the context of a university setting and having to um, critical to address those issues. So we have our high moments of wins, right? And then there's moments of, of lows when we get hit, you know, in the gut. And, and then we have to pick up ourselves up again tomorrow. But I think what I remember always um, is that uh, we're working for or towards the present, but also towards that seventh generation to come. Um, and also understanding that seven generations past has helped us 
see where we're at right now. So that's I where I'm at. <laughs> thank you. Uh, that was a beautiful, that was really a great uh, segue. And I, I appreciate, I appreciate you for the honesty in it and the answer. And, and it's not a simple answer, right? Um, it's not an a simple answer. Um, because how are you is, is very complex, especially when it comes to um, how, not only your family, but your work, right? And so the work that you're doing. So the question I want to ask is, how do you think that racism impacts your work? I, Margarita, why don't you answer that first? Since, because um, I think it's really nicely aligned to what you just said. Well, it impacts my work every day. Uh, many of us were teachers in the classroom before we became university professors, and I think, and then as um, a woman of of color, right? Um, I went into the profession initially as a teacher in the classroom uh, to counter and combat uh, racism, institutionalized racism and inequities. I mean, that was at the forefront, that was at the core. And now today, though I'm teaching now at the university as a professor, um, the work that I do with, with my colleagues, all of you, um, and the systemic inequities and racism that we're trying to confront and challenge and counter in the context of a university system is every day. And it becomes, it can become difficult, I think even more so in the context of the union, because we're trying to challenge systems that have been normed, right? So with all of you as my teaching colleagues, we're able to dialogue and we're able to address uh, head on through our topics and our concepts and the work that we do, how we're challenging racism and how we're hoping to prepare our future teachers. And then on the other end with the work with the union, we know it's, it exists, we know it's there, we see the practices that have taken shape to push out uh, students of color, faculty of color, marginalized communities, um, but then it's so ingrained, especially when we're dialoguing with administration, having uh, meetings with administration and um, others, that it becomes frustrating because it's not evident to them because it's so socialized and so embedded within the system, be it policies that they use to just completely try to counter what we're doing and how we're doing it. And so it's, it can become quite frustrating um, that um, uh, there's a, the system exists. Not, not surprising, so let's just be honest, right? Like not surprising, but um, a system that exists to, to uphold and perpetuate and maintain um, the powers that be, right? Through racism institutionalized uh, context. And I think I find it most, um, I think I, I find uh, hope in, in, in the arenas that I'm in, but it's definitely difficult work and it's, it can be uh, quite challenging to your spirit, right? Quite challenging to your spirit because for I think all of us on this, this dialogue session, this is not just uh, like what we used to say when we were younger, you know, part-time revolutionary work, right? <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is, you know, every day. We're not going to be armchair revolutionaries, you yeah. know? And so, it's, so it can take, a, it can take a, a, a toll in dealing with this. And, and for many of us, we don't have a choice. Like, today I want to deal with racism and tomorrow I don't, you know? Yeah. We're yeah. dealing with it. <laughs> every day because of who we are and right, just right. Our, our, our matter of existence. Yeah. So I'll leave it there for now and let my colleagues build on that as well. Yeah, please. And, um, and when you're answering this, because I think um, Margarita alluded to some push out um, that happens and some sy sy systematized like policies 
that negatively impact you know uh our, our our communities and so can you like as you're thinking about it um and and I, I i'm gonna ask jose to pick up because obviously you have the longest kind of experience with that can you speak to that like what what is that actually so for somebody who doesn't you know know um what that could look like um could you explain what it actually looks like in terms of procedures and policies that are in place that negatively, that are actually systematized racism? Yeah, I think historical reference um, is key. That's when I said in my introduction that I'm, I'm glad to see the resurgence. Because it, it, it highlights for all of us, all of us on this call and those that will listen to it, that the work is not done despite all the good work that has been and to quote Lewis, all the good trouble that has happened since the beginnings of those movements in the late and early 60s and early 70s. Um, I don't think it'll be a surprise to anyone, any of the five of us, how racism has impacted our life's path and work. The only reason I was recruited to Purdue in 1971 was because Purdue didn't have enough people of color on their campuses. It was not surprising that it was a black man who was a recruiter who was sent out across the state of Indiana to find black folk and brown folk and yellow folk and red folk to bring to a campus in the middle of the heartland. So for me, it, it is because of racism that I'm on this call. Uh, it has been at the core of the work that all of us probably have been doing. If it wasn't for racist practices leveled against us and leveled against people around us, we would not have taken up this work. Yeah. I think I speak for all of us when we say that. When I say that, I think some moment in our lives, and, it, and, and it's always, again, an old timer like me gets a chance to sort of look back on it and, and try to explain to myself and students that I've been working with throughout these many years, what the significance of that would be. There were policies in place to your question. There were practices in place to your question that did not allow people of color to get into those tier one institutions. There was a reason that that happened in the end of the 60s and early 70s, when people said, we, we got to do something about this. Interestingly enough, as, as racist a state as Indiana is, it always has had an affirmative action policy. It was because of affirmative action that folks like me were able to integrate Purdue University in that, that fall of 71, um, unlike a state like California that lo these many years later is fighting to undo a policy that prevented folks of color, women and poor folks to have some kind of quote unquote preference. Mm -hmm. It's ironic as hell that we live in one of the progressive states in the country that has an anti-affirmative action policy that will tumble it will tumble, it's, it's gonna fall. Anyway, uh, racism is and always has been at the core of what this country is. Um, again, people like me who have been talking about this and teaching about this for 30 some plus years are feeling, I think, affirmed and vindicated about the movement now. That we were right in saying that. Um, I have always been facetiously at times and not always facetiously, but at times accused of playing the race card too quickly. Um, I never took offense to that because it's damn true. Uh, even when I just said it to you, I felt like I was reaching into my shirt pocket. <laughs> what? To pull out the card. Uh -huh. uh, I, would, I would always much rather play the card and work my ass back from the accusation than to assume that it wasn't racist. That so wait, was always a very inclusive worldview 
it didn't always serve me well personally or professionally. Uh, but I always erred on the side of that because I always assumed that that had always been the framework, that everything else, policies, practices, discriminatory elements of the society, biases, mm -hmm. were all, all roots of the tree. Mm. Um, and I think that's where people are now. I think there's more people who are saying that's at, at the root, that's, that's it, that, here's the tree, and all the roots underneath that tree are all the stuff that we're fighting against, anti-blackness, anti-gayness, anti-poor. But at, at that tree, that fundamental little strong, strong oak has always been a racist America. Mm. And now we're seeing that by cutting away at those roots, that tree is gonna fall. And it's long overdue. It's not gonna be easy to Margarita's comment earlier. A lot of work will come when that tree tumbles. Um, the, the concern I have as the elder is to see who's going to be there yeah. to chop that damn tree up. Just because it falls doesn't mean that that's the end of the struggle. Mm -hmm. You got to chop that, you got to chop that tree up, <laughs> grind it down. Yeah. And so, so I, go I, ahead. I have a question because and, and feel free to chime into this because you started with the race card and then you switched to the metaphor of the tree. And I, I, turn, I, I want to turn to that because you said that you've always felt like, you know, you wanted to start with race as the framework, but the, do you believe that the race card is real or do you think it's really like a systemic, like a tree of racism that is like the, you know, the roots of which are, so what is it? Because I think that's a, you know, um, because when we hear the race card, when I hear it, I think I'm, I connected back to Rodney King and this idea of like playing it as something that's not real. Like you're playing a card, but this racism is just something that you can just wield when you want to, like it's a game, right? As so a I, I, Yeah, I, and I think you're right. I think that, I think the metaphor of the card did come from, some sort of game set in people's heads. Um, I used it because that's how people refer to it, but basically it's a strategy. It's a strategy. When, when you're the only person in the room who invokes a racist lens, that's what people refer to as playing the race card. And does it take, if we take it out of the, the game scenario and just say it's a strategy to alert people it's a strategy to wake people up to an injustice that's framed in a racist context then it's real mm -hmm. yeah. people yeah. can assume it's facetious or game-like in the way it's described but when you're the one person in the room who invokes it mm -hmm. it's it becomes real in that moment as yeah. soon as it leaves your mouth it becomes real yeah. to you and to everybody else who's in the room you have seen colleagues do it margarita has taken up that charge often in our college meetings um, others perhaps i hope will follow as she models it done in a way that's a lot more sophisticated than when i was coming up in the college um, it was effective to some degree back in those days I think the way that you young folk are, are playing the card is different. I think it's more effective. I think in some ways it's a little more diplomatic. So I think the strategy is the same, yeah. but the delivery of it is very, very different. And it should be different. It's yeah. no surprise again to any of us that the folks who are taken to the streets at the core of their protests is nonviolence. Right. They go into those streets assuming, like Lewis did, that harm will come to them. Mm -hmm. But the core of their manifestation of a protest is nonviolent. Yeah. That takes a lot of courage. That's right. That harkens back to another time. 
Right. Uh, and I got caught somewhere in between the nonviolence and being a, a smart ass and a loud ass and taking people down verbally and sometimes physically. And now I'm, I'm progressed in some ways, right? And in my time, it's, it's just kind of falling silent for a minute and, let, and let's see how and where this goes with the new or younger voices, more sophisticated voices, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's great. I wanna, I wanna ask you, Dale, um, to pick up on something that um, Jose was talking about, particularly, because he was talking about like invoking a conversation as a means to address racism, right? Being, being willing to be that voice in the room to, to name things that other people may not feel comfortable doing and to, to actually allow for a discomfort and in some way to do it in, in a way to make people push them to kind of recognize that racism exists on a, on a constant um, basis. Um, so my question for you and Mimi is around what strategies, because um, Jose was saying that's a strategy that he uses, what other strategies do you use? Do you use that strategy? And then what other strategies do you use to address and to deal with racism or even to disrupt racism? Um, you know, in some ways, um, I mean, I was the whole time listening to Jose's response and his response to your probe and then even Margarita's response processing my answer to your first question about how racism impacts you. And I'm, I'm, I'm just did sort of a tape of, you know, since the beginning, so to speak, thinking about um, its specter and its explicitness, both always being there, always being there. Um, and the ways in which I learn to disrupt it is only partly from home upbringing, and it's really more in terms of my formal education. Um, yeah. The specter in this conversation that is the racism that was both explicit and not, you know, I grew up with my father in and out of prison, and so and, and I think more salient as an escaped convict. And part of the psychology of that when you're maintaining a family is to keep everything quiet and don't share a lot of information. So mostly for me, because of the racism related to policing, the way it sort of got down to me was confusion about what, what is going on. So not knowing even, so it wasn't really until I, worked my way through some of that and got into a formal education program, fortunately with revolutionaries, Brown Berets and Black Panthers, who were in a community college program that I began to get some consciousness and really learned that, you know, it's really important to be very explicit. Later on, I learned uh, some more, you might, call on some regards tap dancing or suave ways uh, when we talk about the brain based on all this and that, right? Um, but that, that's, that's late education for me yeah, in some yeah. regards. Um, yeah. Instances when I've been very explicit have been uh, oftentimes really harmful to me, <laughs> really. Um, I, I still progress throughout my career, but probably the most notable, most immediate was when I was a teacher and called it all out and had death threats and was essentially left the classroom, right? There, there, there were like explosive moments like that when you really start pointing and telling and, you know, uh, sour relationships professionally, it, 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 you know, and, 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 and so forth. Uh, and some of the same things, when you ask that question, how does it impact? And I also answer, how do I address um, these same, the syntax of the moments that were both explosive and somewhat harmful, even though I continue to move on, is with me right to this day at 
yeah. various locations in, in, in the institution we're in right now. Right. Uh, so. Um, I'm thrilled. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a bit of a rambling answer in some regard, but like I'm grabbing hold of some real concrete things, both sort of in my historical biography, but also in terms of current lived experience. Right. Things right. that, you know, you see happening over and over, and you come to it with the same fresh rhetoric and mm -hmm. rigor and, you know, I mean, and, 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 and because partly I think um, the learned experience is if you come at it like a James Baldwin and just be impeccable with your shit, then, then <laughs> you gotta see it. They gotta see it, you know? Right. But, but right. no, no, he got, no rage, no. Though. But he got to the rage though, right? And I was just watching this thing on him where people were, uh, uh, um, uh, it's gonna come to me, but it was a, it's a new um, it's a new book that's coming out about his life, and mm -hmm. the the author was basically uh, pointing out that people like earlier Baldwin, and they just you know got upset with him, you know, towards like in his later work because they felt like he was just. You know, he had gone through depression, he gone through rage, and he. So I think part of what this is bringing me to in this conversation is, it's almost like you can't just ask the question about the work, right? Especially when, <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, that wasn't a good question. You know what I mean? Because we're all people of color, right? So it doesn't. It's not just a work thing, right? It's 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 your whole life, right? It's it's everything from birth till. You know, and even posthumously, because we're still talking about people, you know, then how racism mm -hmm. impacts them. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, my God. So then it's not, you know, it's like, because um, like when I was talking to my cousin and, and he, you know, principal and he's doing all this dynamic work, but then he's talking about going to the grocery store and just, you know, that pressure on your neck, right? Because you feel like you're being you know, uh, watched and like, you're not meant, like people don't want you there. Um, I think, uh, Mimi, you have a unique experience too, because you're parenting women of color. And, um, what is that like in terms of the dynamic, in terms of how they, your children experience racism and how you as a mother who was a white, uh, a white woman, who's a mother of children of color, how, do, how do you, how do you, um, how does that impact you and how do you address that? Okay, good. Well, thanks. Um, yeah, I just wanted to clarify for the podcast folks. Um, <laughs> I am very much a white woman coming from a very white encapsulated um, personal background. So f like Dale, you know, I came for different reasons. You know, my childhood was silent on issues of racism. Um, and it, I entered into this sort of academically as well. Um, I was an American studies major and so sort of got an academic um, understanding of American history. And I understand, you know, the tree, as Jose described, the history of racism. But, you know, it wasn't an emotional situation for me with as much depth because I went through the world with white privilege and, um, you know, progressively becoming more of an ally or a, um, what did you say? Uh, uh, well, accomplice, I would say an apprentice maybe, <laughs> and then a co-conspirator, which, you know, I'm still on that journey. And even to be in this conversation is, is a privilege. I realize, you know, folks are trusting me to, um, you know, walk in here with my, with my life experience and, 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 you know, I appreciate that you hold that with, with some gentleness. But um, anyway, to answer your question, so my girls are, um, they have a lot of proximity to whiteness. So that's, that's a thing. But at the same time, that's not, you know, they, they're going out into the world and they're going to progressively be further and further from, from myself and my wife. And um you know, we're very purposefully, we talk about racism, we talk about uh, their identity, we bring as many opportunities as possible. Uh, we go to Latin American Heritage Camp, and it, which is really 
you know, there are a lot of uh, folks that they bring in to help the parents as well as the young folks really have conversations about who are you in the world and how do you, how do you manage your identities and what, you know, it's, it's all okay, you know, to sort of have a love hate relationship with your, your white parents or whatever it is. Um, so I guess, you know, I, I just feel like, you know, when just to, when Jose brings out the race card, which I don't mean to trivialize that, for some reason I have leaned into that. And that I think is my, um, that's why I'm here. Because, you know, folks who know Jose know he can be pretty intimidating, but I was always intrigued and I'm very intrigued. I remain um, intrigued by all I can learn from my colleagues of color and um, perhaps what I can do as a co-conspirator and you know how I can be a model for white educators and that's sort of what you know is much it's become much more emotional for me you know it's I dream I dream in um, my dreams are much more populated by people of color and the trauma and the heartache and the hurt of all of that so that's where I am yeah well, my I mean, yeah. Sorry. Can I add, can I say something? Yes. Or, yes. You know, I was just thinking about what everybody, what Mimi was saying and Dale and Jose and like the, the, the follow up question you had about strategies, right? And um, I think one of the struggles I've had is that um, many people have tried to contain, try to contain people of color's rage mm -hmm. and That's justified right. rage, yeah. you know? And yes, you know, there's a time and place for things, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah, I still struggle with that. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, it, it has to be always addressed head on. Right. There's no tippy-toeing around it. There's no um, sugarcoating it. You know, all these different yeah. phrases that exist um, around making it palatable for the white community. That's right. You know, and to be honest with you, I'm done. Yeah. Right. Um, and I'm done with that. I think there has been moments where I've tried to be like, okay, how can I be strategic with this? Um, but we're just at a crossroads right now where it has to just be straight on addressed, yeah. um, whatever that looks like, you know, sure. whatever that looks like, if you're out, if, if the venue at that moment is you're out on the streets, then that's what it looks like. Yeah. If the venue is you're across, well, at this moment, the Zoom table, right? <laughs> With administrators or whoever it is, then you're, you're calling it out, right? Yes, and you're, and you're, yes. you're naming it, you're putting it there. You're not, yes. you're not appeasing it, you know, mm -hmm. to, so that but people do not better. get hurt. Right, because at the end of the day, like your the feelings could be hurt, but then it's like people are dying, right? We're dying. Like you know, this is not a game. You know what I mean? And this is like like I like my husband and I. We were we we're on a walk, and we were just talking about. You know, we could keep walking, but it seems like we keep we are walking in circles if we keep having these coming right back where we started from. You know, and and we're not moving forward. And it's like you know the the ways in which we had done this before, it just doesn't work anymore. And I think part of that is too, which uh, I'm gonna transition to the, the our, our jobs, because part of what you're saying too, uh, Margarita, around palatable, making ourselves palatable, I feel like in controlling the rage, it's not even just only for white people, because there's a lot of people of color, we have some internalized racism as well, and we don't feel comfortable with other people's rage either because that makes us look bad. And so this is probably why, to Jose's point, maybe there's people who don't, you know, when you say it and they don't say nothing, you know, um, like because they, uh, you know, like I don't want to be out there, or, you know, and put, in, put myself in risk or my job in jeopardy or whatever the case may be. So people aren't willing to, they want to make themselves it's that um that frozen you know the the freeze like that's the freeze that's the invisibility right um stage of like the the complex trauma right so when you freeze you just make yourself 
you know, and I had a, a really uh, a, co a conversation with my cousin and he was saying, you know, just you're not going to win, you know, just, you're not going to win by arguing with the police or these people, you know, you're not going to win by arguing with your parents, you don't win when arguing with your teachers. So just be quiet, like, you know, and I feel like we've internalized some things so we blame, we blame ourselves for the, for the condition that we're, we're all in. Um, so I guess my question is, because um, Mimi, you know, was asked, saying about the ally and the accomplice and the conspirator, but can you explain the difference between those three things? What's the difference between an ally, an accomplice, and a co-conspirator, Margarita? Well, I think I'm going to go to the two and bookmarked ends first. Um, for me, a long time ago, uh, an ally was, okay, you're, you're with me, you're by my side, right? You're going to do this work. But I don't see an ally like that anymore. Um, for me, an, an ally is an individual that can say that they're with me, but really do nothing at the end right? Like just be, um, and a lot of this thinking for me does evolve around Bettina Love's work and so forth. Um, so I want to put that, her name out there. Yes. Um, and others who have contributed as well um, to this. And a co-conspirator is an individual who, and I'm going to use almost like an imagery example, right? Is willing to get in front of me and take the hit. Right. Like, I mean, just that's the only way I can really explain it, you know, for myself. Yeah. And, and I, I started those two ends because for me right now, at least where I'm at, there is no middle ground. Yeah. There's you're here or you're here. Yeah. And, and that's it. Right. right. Um, and so maybe an accomplice might be somewhere in between or more <laughs> towards the end, more towards, you know, yeah. um, yeah. yeah. uh, co-conspirator in, yeah. but I started on those two, two ends intentionally because uh, I know there's no, you know, um, what's what I'm looking for? Uh, well, I, I can't think of the word I'm looking for right now, but that's just really kind of like the, the positionality that I, that I feel I'm in. You're, you're with us or you're not. There's, there's no gray right, right now. There's no like, let me, let me think about like what, what that's gonna, what that means for me. You know, yeah. I mean, now what that looks like, you're in or out. I mean, it all depends what you can, you know, right. what you have access to, what, what, what's your venues, what's the kind of work you do, how are you going to do that through the work that you do, right? right. How are you going to challenge that? But there is no question like, can I have some time to think about it? No, yes. you know, and so, <laughs> yeah, like, so <laughs> you know, I mean, that's just where I'm at. Like, I don't, we, like you said earlier, mm -hmm. like, People are dying. Communities are dying, right? right. Um, in the midst of uh, Black Lives Matter, in the midst of this pandemic, yeah. we're seeing indigenous communities, yes. people of color communities dying. In extra, in the, the statistics are off the charts, yes. right? And so there's no time. Like, okay, I'm with you, but, but I'm, I'm just going to support you. That's yeah. to me the, the ally now. And the co-conspirator is like, I'm with you and I'm like in what's hap what happens in Oregon, uh, what's happening in Oregon right now where you have those moms and dads that are standing in front, that's yes, co-conspirator. Like yes, we're right. gonna take it. Yes, that's right, 